Hello, welcome back. Today's July 19th and we're doing business and security. I think on the 18th I said we did business, but it was really government. Oops. Ha uh ha. -huh. Uh. You fell for it. Today's <laughs> business. You know what else you fell for if you live in the United States? Uh, tax subsidies for how many decades now? <laughs> they've been taking a lot of your money and they've been giving it to these ISPs and it's always been to- This time though, it might work. <laughs> right, it's but been to expand the network, make things better, and yet- we will give you $100 for Linode. Congratulations, the US is 32nd worldwide on broadband availability. But you can be number one in Linode availability by using our <laughs> Linode coupon below. <laughs> what but a good segue. Well, listen, if you can't set up a server at home because your IP address is always changing, your ISP is unreliable, you can't connect to your home server, well, you can host it with Linode and not worry about that. You can even use a Linode server as a gateway for your, your home setup. So if you've got this crazy 50 terabyte you know, media server, it doesn't matter. You can just stream that through your Linode. It's fine. They don't need to know. It's going to be encrypted anyway. It's for your own personal use. Check out the link below. No, but this this article is just about you know subsidies. And they've already handed out 400 million or 500 million of it. And some of it is going to the very large incumbent ISPs to better wire the rural area and it's just it's like i don't understand why this time is going to be different than the other 20 times i love when they compare not just like the size of the network and everything but also how much money from the government goes into korea yeah versus the united states and they have some of the best internet in the world and it's just it's repulsive they don't have to cover as much ground i guess but i don't think that's the issue well i'm thinking about places around here where the the coverage is really bad and it's so bad that there are enough people like us that if we just had a little bit better, you know, if the, if the government said we have this money available, come up with a plan, people like us would be like, all right, we've put a plan together. We're going to use these donkeys to pull the fiber. We need to, you know, you to make the regulatory hurdles go away. And then boom, there would be an amazing network there for everybody to use with and pennies on the dollar. If they made the regulatory hurdles go away, we wouldn't have a chance. Because there's 20 other companies who already have the money <laughs> who would jump in and take that deal. Yeah. Because there's so much money to be made. Yeah. It is really sad. Well, if you are, uh, you know, these time, these days you need a PC to run your television. You can't trust your smart TV. You need a PC to run a variety of things in your life. Maybe you want a little tiny one. Intel in the past was actually pretty good about that. But they're done. Intel has killed its NUC line, but the tiny PC will live on. Intel went out of their way to say that they're still going to help OEMs make tiny form factor PCs and make recommendations on the form factor. It's just that Intel is going to stop competing with them and let other people sell them. So people like Minis Forum and B-Link, those are devices we reviewed, and they've been pretty solid. But uh, Intel NUC still brings some unique features, uh, but no more. This is probably an antitrust defense mechanism. They did the numbers, and they're like, we're not making enough on this to care. So why have this risk? I was just sitting here thinking like, why are they doing this? Because they're competing with yeah. the people who buy from them. And that's questionable. Lena Khan scared them. Uh, I don't know why. But yeah, I mean, it's not been very effective so far. <laughs> and uh, Wi-Fi, we keep getting new Wi-Fi standards, standards, but they're not, we don't get the leaps and bounds that we used to. Maybe there's a new game in town. A hundred times faster than Wi-Fi. Li-Fi, Latin-based networking standard, has been released. 802.11bb is 100 times faster than Wi-Fi and more secure. Because your walls are opaque is why it's more secure. And obviously, you know, it's not going to replace Wi-Fi. But if you have a large building, just have everything going through the lighting system. Totally possible. Neat. And we have uh, the Steam Deck is taking the world by storm. We have the competitors quickly nipping at their heels, but maybe they didn't take quite enough time <laughs> for quality control. Asus confirms its micro SD card reader on the ROG Ally is prone to failure. Not only prone to failure, but also it eats memory cards, <laughs> which is unfortunate if you shelled out for like the one terabyte monster micro SD card. It seems that they seeded the card slot next to the heat sink Ooh. <laughs> and so when you're gaming hard it tends to warm up it's not mm. good for the card reader Oops. and gopros tend to do that a little bit as well yeah. they're gonna put out a patch 
which I think is basically going to max the fans out at all times. Yeah. So your your ally is going to get a lot louder. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, people that bought the Steam Deck are like, yeah. <laughs> Steam Deck 2 is going to be amazing. Now, we've talked about this before, but they're actually shipping now. While I was reading this, I was sitting there thinking, like, there's got to be a hundred ways that I could defeat this, right? Like, yeah. this could be a great deal. But then you look at the terms of service. They've thought of all of them. <laughs> Telly starts shipping free, ad supported 4K TVs, and will charge users up to $1,000 if they violate the terms of service. So this, they're not, the ads are not on the TV. They're on this little advertising bar below it, That's which is mounted to it. And it's got a camera on it, so it's making sure that you're actually looking. <laughs> and if you stop using it or just stick it in a closet, they're going to bill you. Yeah, and you have to use it as your primary television, whatever that means. So if you just put this in the game room and never turn it on. Or like a guest room, yeah. It's going to cost you $1,000. If you break the warranty seal to take the panel off in any way, it's going to cost you $1,000. If you try to block ads in any way, $1,000. This was a joke in 30 Rock like 10 years ago that they were just going to put a bar of advertisements at the bottom of all television shows forever. And now it's a reality. I mean, if they would stitch it back into a single device, we could have a four by three screen aspect ratio again. I would be all about the aspect ratio. That's how 30 Rock did it. And it was a joke. They were like, ha, 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 ha. Wow. It's not a joke. A lot of people signed up for it. <laughs> and if you think that's the worst TV news that we've got for you this week... It's not, because you can obviously just opt out of that by buying a television and not have to worry about that madness. I'll, I'll invest some money up front, but it seems the television selections, much like the smart TVs, are going to be narrowed down into only the worst possible options. LG to offer subscription for appliances and televisions. At first, I was excited. I thought they were creating this the way that Sears did. Sears had a thing where you could subscribe to appliances, and it was great. You mean like get a new one every so many years? Yeah, and they would do all the maintenance and everything for it. Like if you bought their washer and dryer, it was going to be 20% above MSRP, but they would take care of it for five years or replace it. And holy crap, did they ever. Definitely not what they're going to be doing. The use case, it's hard to imagine the use cases here, but one of them yeah. I described is your washing machine, if you move to a new area, might need slightly different settings because of the climate in that area. Which I've never heard of before. I haven't either. It sounds like they just made that up so they could sell subscriptions. And the TV, I guess, will change some of the content. I don't know how exactly that works. Some of it is ads. They get the TV that's got the, or the fridge that's got the LCD screen in it. It's like, oh, here's ads. It's crazy that like you buy this thing and then they like, and you're paying a subscription on top of that. And then you're still getting served ads. Well, that's, that's how TVs work forever. They 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 think they're going to take their business from fifty one billion to seventy eight billion, and I just don't see it. But it's going to be serving. I guess it's two layers of ads in some ways. Yeah, it's just astonishing. Yeah, I mean they can't even do it in a value add kind of a way. I I, I might be more willing to tolerate some sort of smart fridge integration where it's like, this is my current contents. These are the meals that you can make. If you order these, we can plan these meals from here and I get a little commission when you order this crap from Amazon to stuff inside me and it's like uh, okay we'll do that I could we could build that and yeah just sell the data to Walmart and Kroger and get our money back yeah you know, you don't need to... I'm sure someone's already working yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah well CPUs CPUs are hot these days and there's all sorts of sanctions and taxes and duties that you have to pay if you take them across borders some people don't like that. Smuggler nabbed with 306 <laughs> CPUs stuffed in a girdle. What an expensive corset that is. They also point out, unfortunately, they didn't have a picture of it. Also, each leg was covered in CPUs. They uh, Turns out you can sell those in China for a lot of money. This guy was in Hong Kong and he was moving into mainland China. And uh, which you have to pay taxes if you do that. So he's trying to get around it. They caught him because of his unusual gait. Because he was <laughs> dripping with CPUs. Also, they didn't mention the kind of CPUs. Got that drip. But some people have zoomed in on this one. They believe they are Ryzen CPUs. Interesting. 7,000 series. AMD should definitely use the that as like their marketing strategy. <laughs> it's so good, you'll strap it to your body. <laughs> strap in, we're going gaming. Yeah. Oh. And quantum computing continues to be uh, an interesting thing that is beyond the reach of most of us. 
but Google says they have reached an amazing new milestone. Supercomputer makes calculations in the blink of an eye that take rivals 47 years. Google claims blah, 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 a quantum computer. Uh, IBM's got a more impressive one. IBM? Mm-hmm. They got one bigger than this? Yeah. I thought they this got, was the record with like 70 some qubits. They got one that's, they, they've got one in the, their commercial cloud right now that's 433 qubits. They've got a kilocubit one that's in beta testing. But this one doesn't do anything functional. It's still just doing the random number. Yeah. Like proof of concept thing. So it doesn't actually do anything. IBM has a quantum computer in the cloud you can rent time on and run run quantum algorithms on. Right now, today, you can just go do that. And we've been seeing so many of these headlines. Uh, you know, we, I think we should have called the fight, but apparently this referee doesn't want to stop it. So we keep getting these beat down headlines. <laughs> if you're an EV charging company, just wrap it up. Sell <laughs> off your equipment. Mercedes-Benz says, yeah, to Tesla's EV charging connector. Okay. Because they're, Is they're German, German for yeah. yes? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember when we looked at these bikes originally, remember that we were talking about the design of them and stuff, and it was like, I don't know. It doesn't really bring a lot to the table for the price. Will people accept this? Now we know the answer. <laughs> Van Moof, the e-bike darling with the funniest name ever, skids off track as sales boss and execs depart. <laughs> oh, who could have predicted this? So you can't order them online, but you still can through the app. And they called the woman at the desk and she was like, oh, that's actually, uh, that's an accident. You shouldn't be able to buy them anyway. <laughs> Ooh, they don't actually exist, sorry. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, pause sales, a feature, not a bug. You're getting some conflicting. Uh, the Twitter said that it's, yeah, it's just an app problem. Huh. But apparently the girl at the desk had other ideas. She might be a little pissed because she just got a notice that she's, she's being leaving, laid off. Uh... In a couple weeks. And India chips, that's the new thing, the de-risking of China, right? And China, we learned last week, is working overtime to try and discourage this type of thing. I wonder if maybe they got in somebody's ear. Foxconn dumps 19.5 billion of Ven, uh, Vendanta, Vedanta, Vedanta chip plan and Bovina. blow to India. So they will not be making those chips in India after all. Apparently that was because Foxconn has had trouble with just the physical plant manufacturing. So they said, how on earth are we going to be able to do microchips? Yeah, it's definitely a different culture than China. The question is, where are they going instead? Because they got to have somewhere in mind. Is it going to be America? Probably, Probably yeah, we're too expensive. That'd be cool if it was Arizona, though. And Huawei is a company that probably can't go to India. They're kind of married to China at this point, and they're being sanctioned pretty hard. But they claim that they have finally overcome all these obstacles. China's Huawei poised to overcome U.S. ban with return of 5G phones, research firms say. Now, they're going to use the in-house 7 nanometer designs. But some of the people in the article were uh, estimating because of the yields, these prices are going to be at least 50% higher, maybe more than that. So they don't see how they can ever make money because the Chinese phone market is mostly low cost phones. Well, it's not about making money. It's about supplanting all of the other companies in the competition and then, and having then you go out of yeah, business and then you raise the prices after that. Yeah. I mean, it worked brilliantly with surveillance cameras. Almost nobody knows how to make a good surveillance camera anymore. I'll say that. That worked everywhere. Every industry is like that. Well, it's certainly a, a hot thing in China talking about chips. Even uh, apparently the, you know, people on the street, they're concerned about it because they know it affects their lives. They want their country to win. <laughs> they want it so much that it's been dramatized. My Chinese chip is a drama TV series showing how China is coping with the U.S. sanctions. I hope it's like a soap opera. It's yeah, kind of a drama. I don't the, the whole sanctions thing. It doesn't make sense to me on a macroscopic scale, just because it's like okay, we're gonna do the sanctions, but that's just gonna accelerate things in China. It's a little temporary inconvenience for them, but that will only accelerate, you know, the deglobalization of the economy, which seems bad for everybody. Like a global economy is probably good for world peace because you think twice about messing with other countries. Except it's bad for all workers mm. because you will just constantly go to China. Yeah. Or well, the, or the low, whoever the lowest cost is. And all the manufacturing in America will atrophy. <laughs> so, that already happened, though. Oh, <laughs> but you're saying it's a good idea. 
in a controlled way. It's it can't can't in be in the worse. Star Trek way Who's where everything good that? happens. Yeah. <laughs> Who's gonna hold the head of that puppy? <laughs> also, apparently, the word "chip" in China is close to "love," so this is a play on words. Uh. I hope there's love triangles. What are the uh, the poor FTC <laughs> when they're getting kicked around? The arguments that get used against them are usually just insane. Yeah. And it's funny because clearly nobody is reading those. They're just being you know, paid off or lobbied or whatever. But when you actually take a look at them, they are astonishing. You're too dumb to use click to cancel, big businesses says with a straight face to the FTC. The FTC lawyers were completely inequipped to offer a counter argument well, for this. What's crazy about this from like a user experience standpoint, the way that you keep people from accidentally deleting things is you just have a... A prompt that's like, are you sure? Well, actually, that's what they're fighting against. Oh, they don't so want that either. They claim if you can click once to sign up, which is always true, right? Mm. It's like you clicked and it's like, well, we're going to give you a seven-day trial. We've already got your credit card. So, yeah, just enjoy. And then after seven days, everything starts automatically. So they say the cancel should be exactly the same. One click and it's just gone. That seems and, reasonable. But like the Amazon's argument or the, you know, the industry group is saying like, well, hang on here. We need them, once they click, we got to explain to them what they're doing because <laughs> they'll click on it just to see what happens because they're morons. Uh -huh. And then hilariously, when they flip the, the the coin there and they're like, okay, well, on the signups, we want check boxes to say, yes, I agree to this. But yes, I understand in, yeah. it's going to be recurring. Yes. And, and they're like, check boxes? <laughs> People can't do check boxes. Are you insane? They'll just pass out from the mental exertion if we show them checkboxes. I mean, Netflix. the user is an idiot, but maybe not that much of an idiot. Netflix has shown us what it was like because in the beginning, it was very easy to sign up for and then cancel your Netflix. It was just as easy to do one as the other, especially if you had a, your browser set up to autofill your credit card details. And people abused it. Yes, absolutely. It's like you know, a new series came out. I'm going to sign up for Netflix and watch it. And then immediately eight hours later or 12 hours later, whenever the series is over, I'm going to cancel my Netflix. And they still bill you the whole month, but people were doing that. And that's what they really want to avoid. And people, I, I can't believe the FTC didn't make that argument. But people are also surfing from service to service. Yeah. Like they would binge and then go and binge again and then rotate every so many months. That to me points to a pretty savvy consumer. Yeah. Yeah. And if you are a savvy consumer, you probably don't use Salesforce. <laughs> You're probably forced into using it. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of a garbage product. Unfortunately, it's getting more expensive. Salesforce raises prices for the first time in seven years, and its stock rises. Why would they do that? What could they promise that would actually give you more value? Uh, well, you should be able to guess <laughs> AI. Oh. It's funny, though, because some Salesforce insiders told me that their cost of operation, like their technology stack, has gone down dramatically over the last seven years. But their prices haven't. Like, they've saved all the money because AMD's cranking out insanely fast chips. <laughs> now, I could not find in CRMRank.com's article the actual price increases. Did you ever see that? No, it's mm -hmm. because it's it's this is the enterprise thing. So it's one of those things where not everybody pays exactly the same price. No, it's going to be custom. Yeah. It's going to be a sad phone call yeah. for a lot of managers yeah. next week. Yeah. It's like, we only charge you uh, it's $17 per month per user. It's like, but I have 37,000 users. Yeah, we know. Now, when it comes to things that you should be concerned about, it's when industry players want to define the standard or they want to create the regulations. We've seen that from uh, you know various crypto companies. Obviously, Sam Bankman-Fried was doing that kind of thing. Now we got the AI companies do it. And Google is saying, yeah, we should probably be in charge of a new way to do this. <laughs> a principled approach to evolving choice and control for web content. Oh, this is amazing. You should definitely check this out. Because Google realizes they're on the losing end here. They're already, uh, uh, the tides are shifting rapidly. They're getting sued constantly. Yeah. So they want to say, okay, we're going to use this for AI. We're going to use it for whatever we want. And that should be okay. So what they're talking about is the robots.txt file. If you don't know what that is, it's a text file that you can put on your website and say i don't want to be crawled or i can you can crawl this page but you can't crawl this page you can crawl this page for searching but not for ai yeah and so google is saying well you know now that things have changed we need to get to a point where you know we tell different things you can allow different levels of stuff also it, google has been caught ignoring that 
Yeah, it, 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 Google. I mean, now that they have their own AI, I'm sure that they will ignore that as well. Google will deliberately tell you that they don't really pay attention to robots.txt for individual pages anymore because it's too much work computationally to check a page against your robots.txt blacklist to take it out. And instead, you should have something in the header to say, yeah, by the way, don't index this page. Well, I'm sure robots could do that quickly. Yeah. You go an AI that's just working on that. Google also uh, apparently has decided that there's some money to be had. The timing on this one's a little weird. Yeah. Maybe just because the... It was like 20 minutes after the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the, but, or yeah, the but SEC the, Court ruling. The rush is over. Yeah. I guess the, the hardcore peoples can have a place now. Google Play changes its policy on tokenized digital assets allowing NFTs in apps and games. I think this is because they can't be, you know, a party to a lawsuit that's involves, you know, un, undeclared securities or whatever. Oh, you mean the Coinbase? Thing? Yeah. Uh, you think they knew ahead of time? <laughs> I mean, this happened like literally a half an hour after the ruling. That can't be a coincidence, right? And some of the big crypto advertisers early on, the celebrities who told us how great crypto was and how much money we we're going to make are suffering. Oops. <laughs> how Tom Brady's crypto ambitions collided with reality. Didn't go so, well. Yeah, he is... Uh, not only was he the advertiser, but he was paid in uh, the FTC token. FTX? FTX, yeah. Right. And uh, so he's lost all of that, and he's lost a lot of his credibility. Apparently they paid uh, the wife, too, which they're, they're now separated. How sad is that? Mm. I don't know how he's going to get through it. Oh, and the other interesting thing about that article, remember when there was the article that was like, Taylor Swift was too smart for this because she had lawyers in yeah. her family. They say that was not the case. They say that she eventually said yes after they agreed to all her various terms about the unregistered securities and protections. But those protections were so extreme that Sam Bankman Fried turned her down. Oh, interesting. Well, still, I mean, that seems pretty smart on her part. Yeah. I mean, she dodged a big bullet there. And if you're not a big fan of throwing your money at weird crypto tokens, maybe you'd like to throw your money at companies who obviously have no value. And if you are one of those people, bad news. Reddit beats lawsuit by Wall Street Bets founder because he was wanting to trademark Wall Street Bets and some other stuff. And then Reddit wanted to demoderate him from that community. And it turns out, no, it's still Reddit belongs to Reddit, apparently. Well, they didn't just want to. They did. <laughs> He's out. He says it's his brand, and they say, eh, I don't think so. I think this would have gone the other way if that was, you know, slash R slash Cottonelle talking about toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really have a brand that yeah. they care about. Well, I mean, he did trademark it and stuff, so I, it's a really interesting. It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And it's like, But mm. he was not the only meme stock guy. Yeah. So, I don't know. But uh, when it comes to companies that are doing bad things to their brands, you certainly can't discount these guys. <laughs> Oracle takes on Red Hat in a Linux code fight. So we covered last week or the week before about how Red Hat was changing the way that they were sharing code with subscribers only. Well, it turns out Oracle Linux is also based on Red Hat Linux. And Oracle is forking Red Hat Linux and daring Red Hat to, <laughs> to say anything at all about it. <laughs> The enemy of my enemy is my friend, I guess, is the takeaway here. It is a weird argument. It's like, hey, we get this thing for free, but we're going to sell it to you. Nobody else is allowed to. It's like, well, I get it for free, too, and I'm going to sell it, too. What are you going to do about it? Or I'm going to keep giving it to people for free. <laughs> I, no one's got a, a solid standing here. Yeah, that's Oracle Linux. A lot of people in the Linux community popped up also and said, hey, Oracle, um... You get this ZFS thing we really like. Can you dual license ZFS? Because ZFS is open source, but it's uh, can you dual license it so it could also be bundled with the Linux kernel? Because right now those licenses are incompatible, and Oracle has been quiet on that. Well, everybody is dogpiling on Red Hat and doing their own thing. SUSE will fork Red Hat oh. Enterprise Linux. First came Alma Linux, and then Rocky Linux, and now Oracle. And with SUSE coming as well... This is going to be a lot of fun. Everyone's getting forked. <laughs> the user is getting forked. Yeah. I like this, though. I mean, this also underscores, like, Linux is absolutely ubiquitous literally everywhere except desktop computing, <laughs> which is no end of funny to me. Because it's like, well, it's going to be the year of the Linux desktop.
It's literally everywhere. It's in our phones, it's in our routers, it's in our wireless access points, it's in our cars. It is literally everywhere. It's taken the universe over. It's in our network cards now, like the AMD Pensando stuff, <laughs> and in our switches and our team pots. And but it's not on It'll desktop computers on yet because the desktop experience is absolutely terrible. <laughs> now the Chinese have embraced this new idea of doing their shopping on social media. How terrifying is that? <laughs> Like if you're, buying, odd. if you're buying everything from social media, then that means you could get banned from social media and not be able to shop. That's like the <laughs> central bank digital currencies, which is more steps. And Apple has figured out that that's how you got to do business in China. Apple opens a store on China's WeChat platform. I just about had an aneurysm <laughs> reading this because it's just so not apple and apple's like well if this is what we got to do to do business i guess this makes sense we it's need just, more money we're just we're paupers over here apple is so uh all about their app store as a money maker this is very surprising well but this is uh they're selling hardware yeah, yeah. they found out that huawei's phones are going to be 50 percent more expensive and they're like we can compete with that <laughs> our phones are also 50 percent too expensive we have the we have the tsmc story too don't we the TSMC Apple story. Uh, I don't know if we did not. It was uh, the wafers. Uh, Apple changed the deal like Darth Vader style with TSMC. Apple will only buy known good wafers now instead of just the normal wafer price that everybody else pays. That's the latest because the Huawei ones, like none of them are going to be good wafers. Yeah. No, it turns out three nanometers is hard. Well, we have some... Uh, some sads for corporations. Some of them are, are collapsing still. Evernote lays off most of its staff, triggering fears of closure. I remember when Evernote was incredible and then it stopped innovating. And there are so many new competitors and we're gonna learn that Google has an AI generated note taking app, which maybe makes them think that they can't uh, compete with that. Meanwhile, over at Sega, they have uh, had a new thing in their, uh, I don't know, this was like every department, right? One or two departments were already like this, but now I think it's pretty much everybody. Sega of America workers overwhelmingly vote to unionize. And the reason for that is because it just makes sense. They uh, particularly pointed out that they wanted a bigger piece of the profits because they get to see the numbers. And they're like, wow, you're making a lot of money. They also don't want to be crunched to death you think the new blizzard activision conglomeration will crunch their new employees and then Never. fire the people that can't survive the crunch no Never. they promised <laughs> that they would not get rid of any jobs in fact they would be making new jobs so and i trust them completely I, i'm 100 percent sure that it's going to be a pressure cooker situation just as soon as they can and only the people that are willing to endure the most inhumane suffering will be the ones that stay and the other people will effectively be fired. Probably that's, the ones on visa. That's like, how they're going to downsize. But see what they're doing. They're looking at China Yeah. because China has that culture where it's like, oh, you're 35. Mm, maybe we'll just hire somebody else because we don't think that you can handle the pressure we're going to put on you anymore. <laughs> I would like a life outside of work, please. While I, can I have it. children. <laughs> no, get out of here, grandpa. And uh, here's a, an odd story when it comes to the whole idea of uh, databases and how important, how valuable data has become in our everyday lives. Legal dispute could complicate already high pressure organ donation process. When you die, you, they've got a limited time to harvest you before your stuff's not useful anymore to other people. That applies to so many things in our life. <laughs> it really does, yeah. But yeah, so one company was using the database of the other other company, which is public, and they didn't like that. So now they've restricted that. But then the other company says, no, it's we're not using it in an unauthorized way. We're allowed to, just like everybody else. And there's this big argument. And people are worried that this is going to cripple because it's so time sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That some people might actually not get an organ because these guys are fighting them. Don't you think probably some taxpayer dollars went into those databases? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. We should have access to that. And uh, green screen, let me just blow your mind. We're in front of one right now. 
I don't know what background he picked this week. Netflix invents a new green screen filming method using magenta light. It's faster and more accurate for pulling footage and depth information. And that's because they film without even using any green light. And they use AI to fill in the green channel later. So the... Chris, pull your hair to the side. Like, <laughs> all, that, all that nonsense you see in yeah. there, it solves that problem. Fun times. It looks exactly like when you're trying to watch an HDR or Dolby Vision yeah. file and you don't have a codec for it. Yeah. That's interesting. I feel like sometimes shooting in front of a green screen, like at least for television, not like something like this, the lighting is always strange, like because they have to light everything so flat. Well, now they'll be using this light and they can probably just fix it. Yeah. I'll try to fix it in, in post, post, yeah. They'll have an AI doing that. Fun times. We'll start to see. It's like, this looks really good, but just something off about it. That's how I feel about a lot of television. I'm like, this isn't quite right. Well, you know what else isn't quite right? Copy protection, which actually makes everything worse and doesn't actually even work beyond the first 12 to 24 hours. But Ars Technica apparently wants to do some PR for them. <laughs> Genovo wants, to, wants to convince you that its DRM isn't evil. Level one text is here to tell you it is in fact evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only proof you need for this is that the pirate versions of these games always outperform mm. the paid for versions always. <laughs> and so now the, the, uh, the chief operating officer is saying that there are benchmarks coming that are little show that there is no more performance impact, but I promise you there is a performance impact. And again, it buys them one day, usually maybe sometimes a week, but never more than that. Uh, the, the, the most recent time I was heartbroken, I think was with, uh, doom eternal, which was a lot of fun. It ran like grease lightning under Linux, under virtualization. And they didn't have de novo. They didn't have any copy protection the first day or two that it was out. And then they added it and then it no longer worked under Linux and the performance was garbage. They pointed out some fighting game, which, you know, these fighting game people are like, they're looking at frame to frame with their insane uh, competitions and they were all like this is trash because i'm getting lag from frame to frame and one of the developers sort of broke ranks and he was like yeah it's because de novo <laughs> and they were very upset about that yeah well i mean there are pirated versions of things that also have that same experience it's really interesting from now on a bit the contract says your developers are not allowed to say this on twitter yeah they'll do it on threads well uh krista calibri is the current like yeah universal default. font how do you feel about it it's fine i usually it's not my preferred one but it's fine and i know it'll work on most people's machines which is what maybe matters what about aptos it's fine meet microsoft office's new default font aptos this looks like a mix between arial and helvetica it's fine <laughs> don't i mean it's it's a sans serif i can't tell the difference oh no Cal calibri is more rounded this feels more like, um, I guess, more modern a little bit, but. I'm not looking for modernity in my fonts. Well, it's just going to be for body text most of the time. I wouldn't wouldn't think too much of it. Here's a headline we've done at least 10 times, right? Chinese hackers raided U.S. government email accounts by exploiting Microsoft Cloud Bug. Interestingly, it was just 25 accounts. Hmm. They were trying to keep a very low profile, but they were noticed. But how long were they there before they were noticed? Yeah, probably a long time. It was actually just intern accounts. They have to get pizza a lot for these people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is something that we've seen over and over. Every country wants a universal biometric database that captures everyone and keeps track of them. None of them can secure it. Bangladesh government website leaks citizens' personal data. They built the database and they failed to secure the database. Tale as old as time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they had a lot of problems with this in the 1800s. Uh, oh, we've done multiple stories like this in the last couple of years. And we've learned that uh, some of the hacking groups are going after all of the various uh, health services and stuff. That's a big, big uh, returns on that, I guess. I don't know if they're actually paying them or whatever, but the data is valuable. So they continue to do it. UK battles hacking wave as ransomware gang claims the biggest ever national health services breach. They say that they are urgently investigating the alleged theft of patient data. So the ransomware people find that people will pay not to have their medical maladies uh, 
made public. So they go after that. At this point, like, I don't believe that my healthcare professionals are ever looking back at my records. Yeah. They don't, they, they see them when they're in the room with me. Yeah. And then it's completely blanked out of their mind. Yeah. Why don't you just let me carry them around? Yeah. Why do you need them? Yeah. Every time I've been in for a follow up, I've had to remind them about three unusual things. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not the atypical case because this. And they're like, what? And I was like, that's on my imaging. It's on page six. And they, yeah. they look at it and they're like, oh, yeah. My that's family right. keeps their own medical <laughs> records. Like, my mom has a pacemaker. And every time we go, we always write down, like, what her doctor said, what day they said it. Any changes, whatever. But you're going like once every couple of months these days. <laughs> yeah. Think about people like I never you're going all yeah. the time. Yeah. So yeah, you're just screwed. Yeah, but yeah. so are you. Yeah, like the, there's no reason for them to have these records because they don't use them for anything that benefits us. I could, I would be fine if they kept the records, but I was carrying around a decryption key, and it's like. <laughs> Let me just hit the button. It could, it could be like SSH too. Like Until when, someone loses it and then it's like, oh, no one has your medical records anymore. And old people are not going to be able to do that. When, yeah. when I'm trying to establish a new SSH connection, I get a little pop-up and it's like, hey, this thing wants to use your key. It's his fingerprint. Is this? Is this okay? Yes. There's a web-based portal with my medical records. I could get a little ping on my phone that's like, hey, so-and-so is trying to access your medical records. Do you want to grant access to the key? Yeah. We have the technology. Why aren't we doing this? Because they don't see that as yours. <laughs> like, no, that's our day. Can we use your key to unlock this record? Yes. That we have. We can do that. Why aren't we doing that? Oh, you know what? I've we should have put this with the other. I just realized I was wrong about the other one. This is the one that was community service. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But still. Yeah, that's not Community enough. service? Miffed Rainbow Six Siege player sentenced for swatting Ubisoft Montreal's offices. Uh, Yanni Obiolone? Good that nice try. Good attempt. Yeah. Twenty-two will serve three years of community service. Now, this also this guy, I might have attributed some of this guy's actions to the other guy too, but he did not just do these guys. He attacked he DDoSed some people, the French government. The other guy was just a horrible, angry racist and then targeted the community manager. I don't think this guy did anything quite like that. It was this more the went, whole office. He went against uh, went after Minecraft developers. I mean, I get being frustrated with the way that games go sometimes, but like, this is unhinged. Well, what happened? Touch to him, grass. He got banned. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he claimed that he had spent fifteen hundred dollars on cosmetics in Rainbow Six. Well, whose fault is that? I'm more clearly <laughs> uh, not, we're dealing with an individual who has a severe problem. Yeah, no happen. impulse control. Yeah. Wild. Fun times. Well, we got all kinds of nonsense lined up for you Friday. Yeah, we will see you guys then. Also, a bunch of AI stories. Bye.